December the 13th, mark down December the 13th in the morning on your calendar. December the 13th, we will be having a congregational meeting. And the purpose of that meeting is for the election of officers. We have men standing for both uh, elder and deacon. And uh, we will be uh, voting on uh, having those men uh, serve the church and serve us as a congregation. So it's important that you are uh, here for that. And we will also be uh, voting whether or not to approve the budget for the upcoming year at the congregational meeting on December 13th. So again, December 13th, uh, please put that in your calendar and uh, plan to, to be here that morning. Uh, the second announcement uh, is there's a couple of inserts in your bulletin um, that for upcoming events uh, within the church. And the first one is the Ebenezer Women's Ministries annual meeting and Christmas brunch. Uh, that is on December the 5th at 10 a.m. And so uh, RSVPs are due November 30th. And so if you are planning to attend that uh, meeting, please make sure you RSVP. If you're sitting on the fence, I would encourage you to make every effort to come and learn more about our women's ministries here at Ebenezer and uh, how you can get involved and serve and, um, uh, and uh, with, with the women's ministries here. So that's, that's the first one uh, with, the, with the reminder to RSVP. And the second one is the Ebenezer Family Christmas Dinner Theater. So you also have this insert. Uh, and you'll notice that there's uh, two options this year. So we're doing things a little bit differently this year. Uh, we will be doing an early uh, uh, Christmas uh, theater uh, with a dinner to go. And then the second option will be a later performance with a socially distanced dinner uh, served in the gym. And so there's two options for folks uh, to be able to come and enjoy uh, the program that our children have been working on uh, for this year's uh, Christmas theater. So again, that's December the 20th, uh, and, and there's two options. And again, uh, please note on the bottom of the form, uh, the RSVP that we need to get a head count for each one, uh, including uh, your, your meal selection. So uh, please be reminded of those two announcements. Um, and uh, also, I think finally, the uh, basketball signups are going on. So for those of you with children, uh, if you're interested in your children uh, playing in the youth basketball leagues, uh, please contact Adam Hare uh, to get signed up for those. And thankful for Adam organizing that this year. There are some extra precautions in place uh, due to COVID-19 and some extra restrictions on um, wearing masks and, and the number of parents uh, or number of uh, spectators that can come to the games. And so we are trying to, uh, the, the basketball league is trying to take necessary precautions uh, while still allowing the, the children to, uh, to play. And so please contact Adam Hare if you are interested in signing up for that. And now as we turn our attention to the reason that we're gathered here this morning, which is the worship of our triune God, uh, please take the next few minutes and prepare your hearts for worship. The triune God, the maker of the heavens and the earth and all that they contain, 
and the sustainer of them by the word of his power calls you to worship this morning from Romans chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. You know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let's pray. Mighty God, triune Father, you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are mighty and powerful. Lord, and you bid us to come into your presence this morning. You bid us to come and to bring our praises before your throne of grace. Lord, we do not come standing in our own merit and standing on our own goodness, Lord, but we come before you using the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we come before you as those that have been given the Holy Spirit to indwell us and to open our eyes and to open our minds so that we may open our mouths and praise you. Lord, apart from your enabling work this morning, We cannot worship you. We cannot be those that worship in spirit and truth. So we pray that you would come, meet with us, enable us to do that great work of praise. Prepare our hearts to hear your word read and prayed over us. Lord, and be magnified and glorified by the praise that we offer you this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Our first hymn this morning is, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. You'll find the words printed on the insert of your bulletin. Uh, We will remain seated, but we will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Verses 1, 2, and 4.
Psalm, one, Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine, that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. Verse 17. But let your hand be on the man on your right hand, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. Thank you. 
Amen. That same King of Israel, God who took on flesh, bids us to come before him in prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, most high, most holy, you are the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. To you belong honor and glory forever and ever. We humbly come before your throne of grace, and we ask you to look upon Christ and his sacrifice for our sins as we bring our prayers and petitions before you. We confess that we are not worthy of the steadfast love and faithfulness that you have shown to us. We're not fit to call upon your name, but you have appointed for us a great high priest in Jesus Christ so that we may draw near to you with confidence and receive mercy. You've commanded us to ask, seek, and knock. So we do that in the name of Christ, and we ask that you pour out your spirit of grace upon us, your people, so that we might open our mouths and proclaim your praise. Almighty God, you are wise. Your understanding is infinite. Your judgments are unsearchable and your ways are past finding out. The heavens and the earth and all that they contain are yours. In your hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains. The sea is yours, for you made it, and your hands formed the dry land. You sustain all that you've created, and you rule over it as an everlasting kingdom. Lord, we confess that you are a righteous ruler and that your ways are truth and justice. You're alone in all of your perfections, and in your rule you take counsel from no other. We praise you for you are unchanging, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God, and your years will have no end. Lord, you're faithful. Every word that you have spoken will come to pass. Every promise that you have made will be maintained. You're omnipresent. We can't go anywhere from your presence or flee from your spirit. If we ascend to heaven, you are there. If we make our bed in the depths of the earth, behold, you are there. If we take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead us and your right hand shall hold us. Lord, you're omniscient. All of our ways are before you. There's nothing hidden from you. You know our thoughts, our rising up and our lying down. We praise you, mighty God, for you have made known your salvation. You have revealed your righteousness in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth have seen it. In your works of creation, your eternal power and divine nature are clearly perceived, so all men are without excuse when they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images, ideologies, other false gods. We confess that your right hand and your holy arm have worked salvation for you, and you have remembered your steadfast love and your faithfulness to us, your people. Lord, it's in light of this great salvation, steadfast love and faithfulness, that we must confess that we have sinned. We've done wrong. We've acted wickedly. We've rebelled. We've turned aside from your commandments and statutes. We've not listened to your word given to us in your holy scriptures, faithfully proclaimed by the ministers of your gospel. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us belongs open shame because we have sinned against you. We confess that none are righteous, no, not one. We've all turned aside. In our sin, we live as if there's no fear of God before our eyes. We pray, Lord, that you would show us our transgressions. Make them ever before us. Teach us that we have sinned against you and only you. Cause us to know that we've done evil in your sight. 
Then, Lord, give us the blessing of true repentance so that we may turn from our sins and live holy lives before you. Lord, having confessed our sins, we pray that you would blot out our transgressions for your own sake and for the sake of your beloved Son and remember our sins no more. You've told us that whoever confesses their sins and does not hide their transgressions will obtain mercy. So we ask that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness and forgive our sins as we look to Christ for salvation. Merciful Father, we pray for your blessings upon us, your people, and for your church. We praise you for blessing us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We pray for your guidance in our lives. Teach us how to use our spiritual gifts for the edification of the body and the building up of your kingdom. Cause our minds to be set on the things that are eternal, not on the things below which are temporary. Remove the doubts that ensnare our minds and give us assurance of our salvation. Say to our souls, I am your salvation. Remind us that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and that everyone who believes in Jesus Christ will not be put to open shame. Give us grace to put off fear and anxiety and to put on prayer, supplication, and thankfulness so that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. O sovereign King, you've told us that your will in Christ Jesus is for us to give thanks in all circumstances. So we thank you for giving us the scriptures, for their clear testimony of Christ, and for the way of salvation. We thank you for establishing your church on earth and protecting and preserving her as the bride of Christ. We thank you for the gift of true fellowship we have within the church since we are united in Christ and that you have not left us alone, but you've given us brothers and sisters to help bear our burdens and to minister to us in our time of need. We thank you for preserving our faith and for not allowing us to turn away from you to follow other gods. We also thank you for the many trials and tribulations that you bring into our lives as a loving father. We confess that we are often weak in these trials. We forget that you desire to bless us and not curse us. We forget your promise that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Loving Father, cause us to remember that the testing of our faith will result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There are many among us now, Lord, that are in the midst of difficult trials and tribulations. Lord, help them to see their loving Savior who was tempted and who himself suffered so that now he is able to keep those who are being tempted. Whether we're grieving the loss of a loved one, hurting due to broken relationships, struggling with assurance of our salvation, fighting depression, seemingly trapped in indwelling sin, discontent with your providence in our lives, or living through the pain of watching a loved one live in unbelief. And all these sustain us by the indwelling Holy Spirit, strengthen us by the reading and preaching of your word, and help us to see by faith that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Lord, there are also those among us that are sick and some burdened by the weight of medical conditions without a sure diagnosis. We pray that you would comfort them, for their condition is no mystery to you. Help them to not lose faith. Open their eyes to see that though the outward man may perish, The inward man is being renewed day by day, and you are working for them a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, Lord, as we come to the preaching of your word, we pray that you would direct our hearts to glory in the mystery of godliness made known in the person and work of Christ. By your Spirit, strengthen our inner being so that we will know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. And do for us now far more abundantly than that 
all that we ask or all that we think according to the power at work within us. For we pray in that name that is above all names, the name that every tongue will confess and before which every knee will bow. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. That's right, the kids can be released. Good morning. What a privilege it is to be here with you. If you have a Bible, if you could open it up to the first chapter of Acts, and it, as is our custom, if you're able, if you could stand for the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> Beginning in the first verse, Acts 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. That's the instant reading of God's holy, inerrant word. You may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, we are those who need your word. Awaken us, Father. Speak by your word, by your spirit, to our hearts. We come to you expectantly, longing to hear the words that come out of your mouth. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we come into the Advent season. Advent comes from a word meaning come. Jesus has come. Galatians 4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those born under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Truly God the Son came down. Who was Jesus? He was God the Son become man walking among us. Now if you can imagine the disciples in Acts 1, how they would have felt, they had lived with the word become flesh, beheld his glory for three years, lived, ate, slept, drank, ministered with him to see him then die, experiencing their deepest grief and sadness in the face of his death, their seeming greatest loss, their misery, their midnight of sadness. But Mary came back with good news. He's risen. You may meet him. So they do. He restores Peter in John 21. They eat 
fish with him the shores. They put their hands in his side through many convincing proofs of his risen physicality, his reality. They're with him for 40 days, Acts here says, speaking about the kingdom of God. And then when he ascends up into heaven, you can imagine, because they're just as ignorant as we are, they don't know what's going on. They're staring up into heaven. He's their Lord and Master being taken away from them. Okay, now what? So that's the title of my sermon today, Now What? Men of Galilee, the two angels, appear and say, Why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go. In other words... What are you waiting for? Get to it. You know, church history is filled with now what moments. Moments of great time, great change, when expectations are shattered, when the status quo rapidly changes. The way you thought things were going to go and be is suddenly and irreversibly changed. And you're in a different place. And all the rules and all the expectations, all the things you had learned about how to operate in the way things used to be no longer apply because we're in a new day. Church history is filled with times like that. Now what moment? Staring into heaven. For instance, after the persecution of Stephen, the great persecution that came that scattered the church throughout the Roman Empire, the church would have had no way to see that the results of that would have actually eventually be positive because they were being scattered over the known world. How about when Peter and Paul those great icons of the faith put to death in Rome. How about when Nero, Decius, and Diocletian institute empire-wide persecution? This thing was supposed to take over the world. We're all being killed. Or in a different way, they get used to persecution in a sense, not that you ever really do. But when Constantine ends, as a, ends official persecution and Christianity becomes a state religion, how do we operate now? What do we do with the people who seemingly left the faith and now want to come back? What are the rules now? What do we do? How about when Islam takes most of the lands of the Eastern Church? So the culture is still Christian, but we're being, we're being ruled by Muslims. What do we do? How do we operate in this environment? The entire game has changed. What about during the killing time in Scotland when so many of our Presbyterian forebears immigrated to the States? We're in a bit of a what now moment now, aren't we? I wouldn't say it arises to the severity of any of those, but we're very much distracted, both from the person of Christ and from his mission as a church. We very much need to refocus during this what now moment, during the Advent this year. So this sermon is a call for us to use Advent, use these weeks when we're focusing on the person of Christ and his work, to refocus on his mission, his person and his mission. So first I want to look at what I'm calling a striking parallel, that there is a striking parallel between the disciples and these people who are going to populate the upper room, the spirit comes down between though, that crowd and us. It's found in the first chapter of Acts, verse 6 through 8. Read those quickly. So when they had come together, they, as they, being the disciples, asked him, that is Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. They were looking for the risen Jesus to politically bring in the kingdom of God. And that's not even wrong for them to think that. It wasn't a bad question. I think it was the right question. They were just limited in their knowledge. They know, as we know, that at some point, the Old Testament promises of David's Messiah ruling the nations of the earth outward and physically must come true. 
That is at the base of our, the hope of our hearts, and it's not wrong. One thinks of Psalms for, uh, chapter 2. While the nations rage and the people's plot in vain, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Sounds pretty political to me. I will tell the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is the desire of every Christian heart. The day when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When every injustice is crushed, when justice is vindicated, when holiness triumphs, when the saints rejoice in God their Father and the bride is eternally united with her divine groom. When the nations stream into Israel, the church, and bow before our king. The disciples were hoping the risen Jesus would go ahead and bring that day. Their desire was correct. And for us, this certainly motivates our political action, does it not? We vote and we act so as to promote Christ and his agenda in the public arena. This is right. But what is Christ's response? It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Why are you staring in the sky like the end's going to come now? This is what Christ is saying to Ebenezer by his spirit and his word this morning. And I want you to think about the result of the disciples and those in the upper room, this small little 120 folks, 120 souls. Look at the result of their receiving this word from Jesus in the first century and ask yourself, what could be the result in our day? in our little what now moment. Acts begins in Jerusalem with people confused about what to do next, staring at the sky. It ends with the Apostle Paul in Rome somehow still evangelizing the entire city while in house arrest. Somehow, some way, the gospel has exploded from 120 souls in a small upper room all the way across the empire along the 2,518-mile journey westward to Rome in a mere 35 years between 80, 30, and 65, a day with no cars, no planes, just feet and hearts filled with blazing love. And I didn't, it Acts doesn't even touch the journey to the east, eventually reaching 5,000 miles to Japan. Or its journey south to Ethiopia, or north to the Mongols. So there are two elements. I want to look at this power-packed text, this order that Jesus gives them just before they're staring into heaven. One, you will receive power when the Spirit has come upon you. And secondly, you will be my witnesses in increasing concentric circles. So I want to look at both of those, the power of the Spirit and this increasing concentric circles in the next two sections of my sermon. So first, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now this is referring, here's how smart I am, in Acts 1 to Acts 2. Pentecost is coming. So this is referring to Pentecost when the Spirit of Christ came down from the Father and to the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not ascend and simply say, do what you want. Y'all figure it out. Now I'm going to be watching and I'm going to be irritated if you don't do it the way I would have done it if I were still here. He says, I'm going to ascend and I'm going to send you another comforter, one like me. I'm going to be with you by my spirit. 
He sends the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, although a distinct person, is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. It is His Spirit. They are consubstantial, meaning if you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Son of God. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, you do not have Jesus. To have the Spirit is to have Jesus. Now, there's a common mistake that people make. They'll say, and we say this a lot, the early church was special. They had the Spirit. The Spirit was with them in a way he's simply not present with us now. This is just completely false. In reality, the Spirit was once for all granted. I want to take that phrase, once for all granted, I want to state it to you theologically, then I want to state it to you practically. So the theological statement runs thusly. By the atonement, that is the cross, Jesus permanently stabilized in our nature the spirit he received in our place at his baptism. Therefore, at Pentecost, he pours out his spirit in his church permanently to all those who have union with him which is to say he came down and he stayed down. Now let me say it practically. The Holy Spirit is not a yo-yo. He's not bouncing up and down. He's here sometimes and sometimes he's not. He's more with them, he's less with them, he comes and he goes like a ghost. That's not the Holy Spirit. He's not a yo-yo. So for me to state it theologically or to give you the analogy is to say the same thing. Now how do we know this? Well, Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, 16 through 17, he says this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, there it is, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. And you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So Jesus promises another helper. So he said, I'm a helper. I'm an advocate, I'm a comforter, and another helper, another advocate, another comforter is going to come. So the Spirit coming at Pentecost is just like Jesus coming at the Incarnation, the Advent, the Word become flesh. Now that's not true in every sense, the Spirit doesn't get a body. But it is true in the sense that we're talking of here. The coming of Christ, the coming of the Holy Spirit are in parallel in this text. So when Jesus came down, did he continually go up and down? No, he did not. One of his names is dedicated to this fact. He is Emmanuel, God with us. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't go up and down. This means that the Spirit is with us to the same degree he was with the apostles themselves. We don't need another Pentecost to make him be more here. He's here. He is permanently invested in the life of the church, sent by Jesus from the Father. That's the Holy Spirit. To have the Spirit is to have Jesus. He's here. He's not leaving. Now, he may grant us seasons where we're experiencing more. It's called renewal or revival. But revival is not the initial coming of the Spirit because he's already here. Now with that said, if you're thinking, you might think about texts like Isaiah 44.3, which reads this, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my Spirit upon your offspring, my blessing on your descendant. It's not wrong to pray God send down the Holy Spirit because the Scripture uses language of the outpouring of the Spirit which is he comes from heaven to us. So it's not wrong to pray. As long as we understand, we're not praying that prayer as orphans. We are not those who lack the Spirit. We are praying as those who have the Spirit, asking for our full inheritance in the Son. Do you understand? All right, moving on to my next section. The second half of that admonition, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. The key noun there is witnesses. What does it mean to be a witness? This is a big idea. It's very important to understand. Well, we're in the middle of a sermon series on Revelations. I'm going to 
sort of kept there for a minute and things you already know, texts that have already been preached to you. And in Revelation 11, there are these two witnesses, and it's Jesus says he will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. Now what does that mean? It means that we are those, the unified witness of the church, that's why there's two witnesses, they're unified Though we are those who bear witness of the risen Lord to the nations of the earth for these 1260 days, which are the end times, the inter-advental period between the coming of Christ and the return of Christ. We bear witness during the entire time. It's like a text I quoted when I you know, started. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law. This, when the fullness of time had fully come, between the advents of Jesus Christ, we bear witness to the nations of the earth, between the resurrection and return, the one we're bearing witness of, Jesus Christ. And it says we are those who prophesy in sackcloth. And it says, quote, fire pours out of our mouth and consumes our foes. It goes on to say, quote, we have the power to shut the sky. I'm describing the witness of the church. We have power to shut the sky. That no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Who have the power, quote, over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. End quote. Revelation 11 describing the witness of the church. Now the text, I would be remiss if I Oh, if I only describe the power of being a witness, I didn't describe the suffering, because the text goes on to say that Christ's enemies will, will kill us and will seem to have gained a victory over us, but we will be vindicated at the end just like Christ was. Now you might say, now Matt told us these descriptions are symbolic. I would remind you, Matt also told you the fact that they're symbolic means that they are no less real. Yes, these descriptions are symbolic, but that does not sound to me like the early church had more power for witness than us. To be a witness church is to be a prophetic church. Not in the sense of getting new revelation, but in the sense of witnessing to Christ's finished revelation in the Bible. The Son of God has come. He has given us his gospel. To be a witness means that the entire world is a courtroom. And we are bearing witness to something that has already occurred. The coming of Jesus Christ. Everyone in the courtroom must align themselves for or against the testimony of the witness. When he returns, he himself will render the verdict over every person. That's the reality that we live in. That's the reality of our days, the reality of what it means to be a witness. Can you imagine being such a witness, living in such days, having such importance? The waste it would be to be distracted over things that, while important, pale in comparison to our witness. All the things that pull our eyes off of the person of Jesus and his work, the mission in him. So I want to take that thought like a kernel and run with it, giving you some implications and applications of our text. I want to look at these, calling them concentric circles, Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. What that means is that mission, the person and coming from Christ, his work, the mission of Christ, is one fundamental movement with distinguishable geographic spheres. One fundamental movement with distinguishable geographic spheres. Not separable, but distinguishable. Why does that matter? Oftentimes I hear young evangelicals increasingly say that older evangelicals emphasize foreign missions too much. We say local missions matter more. That the older emphasis on foreign missions was just a boomer thing. But in reality, this is nothing new. The church has always struggled with this. The Jerusalem church thought, y'all just need to do things our way. Once things get beyond our borders, we need to control it. 
How did the apostles deal with the local missions only people? Their response was very simple. They simply refused to think of the spheres, these concentric spheres, local, foreign, regional. They refused to think of the geographic spheres and the movement outward through them as separable. This is the insight that we need. If we lose one, we lose the other. The role of foreign missions is to inflame local mission. It is what provides unity, flame, and passion. What is a knife for? A knife is for the edge. The outer part reaching as far as it possibly can. If you lose the edge, you lose the knife. It's just a paperweight. Local and foreign missions working together. So that's one implication of these concentric circles in the text. The other is a caution. If you add to that idea of the spreading of missions through the circles, a caution about the increasing xenophobia in politics. The tendency is to ghettoize. You know what I mean. It's the thinking where we say they don't matter, whoever they are. We need to take care of us. And the identity of they and us, of course, changes depending on which subculture you identify with. But one thing is sure, there is a they and there is an us, and they are the problem, not us. That drains missions. Because the mission of Jesus, what he came to bring is to take his gospel to his enemies. Missions is about reaching out to them the early church responds to the increasing xenophobia of their own culture, and make no mistake, they were worse, is to double down on the apostolic missionary mandate to take the gospel where it had never been. They did the opposite of ghettoize. They mobilized. They went to the very people their own people despised most. Who does your subculture hate? That's who we should reach. Who does your subculture despise? That's who should be our friends. That's mission. Now, in light of these things, what should we do? What does an individual do? First of all, we can't make the book of Acts happen again. It's not in my power. But what I can do is change my mindset. One practical suggestion might be to allow myself to only absorb political material the same number of minutes or less that I have read the Bible that day? Should we not at least give God equal um, audience with our eyeballs and our souls? I can repent of the things that have distracted me. I can ask God to renew me by his spirit, and I can ask God to renew my witness for him. Those are four things I can do. What can groups in the church do? If you're in a small group, if you're in a prayer group, if you're in a circle, if you're in the deacons or the elders. What can we do in the small groups in the church? We can change our mindset. That we can realize comes about to realize the purpose of your group is to be a Revelation 11 witness. I can ask, we can ask together, what is the role of our group in God's mission? We can repent of the things that have distracted us as a group. We can ask God to renew us together by his spirit. We can ask God to renew and define our group's witness for him. Lastly, what can the entire church do? We cannot bring the kingdom to Rock Hill to that first concentric circle without the work of the Spirit. But we can change our mindset. We can realize the Spirit is here. What are we waiting for? The purpose of our church is to bear witness of Christ to this world as part of the end times courtroom that is our world. That courtroom, that's reality. We can live as if it is not, but that is reality whether we recognize it or not. So we can drop petty squabbles and distractions and turn towards Christ and his mission. That's something that we can do. We can change our mindset. We can repent of those things that have distracted us as a church. Remember, I began by saying politics do matter. It is right to hold forth a zeal that one day the nations will stream to the feet of Christ. But what does he say to us? It is not for you to know. So we need to turn not just from our sin, but for an unbalance. 
focusing on things that matter less, that though they are true in the end, we have not, given, we have not been given knowledge of now. We can ask God to renew us by his Holy Spirit, corporately together by his Spirit, mask and all. And he certainly will if we ask. We can ask God to renew and define our church's witness as we come through Advent, we go into next year, voting officers in. How do we renew our focus on being a witness in our Jerusalem, Rock Hill, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, never separating those? Lastly, we can cry out for the Spirit to renew us this Advent season, that even as he, the sun came down to the world, he may freshly come down into our hearts by his Spirit, resetting our minds on Christ and his, and his mission. I want to return to this thought and then pray. To be a witness church is to be a prophetic church, not in the sense of getting new revelation, but in the sense of witnessing to Christ's finished revelation in the Bible, to be a witness means that the entire world is a courtroom and we are bearing witness to something that has already occurred, the coming of Jesus Christ. Everyone in a courtroom must align themselves for or against the witness we bring to Christ. When he returns, he will himself render verdict over every person. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know. Times or seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, we recognize that you gave this word to the apostles. And when they took their minds off of distractions and your spirit came at Pentecost, which we have the spirit because of Pentecost, it impelled this incredible movement where the gospel spread all over the world. Help that to be repeated in our age. Enable us, Father, Lord, we confess to you, we do long for the day when the nations of the earth stream in before Christ and bow before him and declare his name. But his, it has not been given to us to know when that day would come. We rest in that. And we take our eyes even now off of trying to make that happen, putting our hopes in places that while the hope is not ultimately wrong, we've, been not, we've not been given to know how it would work itself out. We take our eyes off of those things, off of our sin. We repent even now from the, from the sin and also from our lack of balance. We put our eyes on the person of your Son, Father, and we ask you for the person of your Spirit that we would be renewed and go forth that this Advent season when we consider the glory, the wonder that in the fullness of time you sent forth your Son born of a woman, born under law, that you might redeem those under law, that we might receive the adoption as children of God. Renew that knowledge in us. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to understand that in all the ways we've been in sin or distracted, there is grace. There is a full inheritance of grace for us. Even people like us at Ebenezer so easily distracted and turned aside. There is grace to return. So we do that now. Forgive us. Cleanse us. Renew us. Build us together with such unity that the witness that trumpets forth from our church that you would use would echo forever. I pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, for our final hymn, we're going to stand and sing once in David's, in Royal David City. It's printed in your bulletin. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4.
one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.